Welcome to McCann Meets, a feature where I chat to the movers and shakers of the sporting and wider world. Today on a park bench in Kew Gardens with the traffic passing by, I have the pleasure of the company of Andy Stevenson. He can be found on Twitter at AndyStevenson81, with his bio explaining that he was born in Northern Ireland without a full complement of limbs. Amongst others, he's worked for BBC Berkshire and then Channel 4 ahead of the Rio Paralympics, which he considers a career highlight alongside his work with Sports Personality of the Year. Des Liner and John Barnes are his heroes, and at sixth form, he was the worst male hair disaster. You might have heard him reporting on BBC Radio 5 Live and Final Score, as well as working as a producer for Whisper Films, a sports production company who are going from strength to strength. Andy, thank you for your time in joining me on the mean streets of Kew Gardens. Okay. Good to have you on. Thanks very much, and thanks for describing me as a mover and a shaker. <laughs> I mean, that's first time for everything. <laughs> so, for someone who doesn't know you and what you do, obviously I've given that introduction, how would you describe both yourself and what you're doing as a profession? I guess I would say that I have a day job, which has um, been in TV production for over a decade now, and then at weekends and on occasional major events I get to get to also be a broadcaster which is something that's very important to me and something I really love um, growing up as you mentioned one of my heroes was Des Line and my you know even actually from quite early on as a, as a kid certainly as a teenager I'd be watching these sporting events on the telly and I'd be watching them almost as much for the build-up and the half-time analysis and the you know the the closer at the end of the tournaments as much for the actual sport itself so you know early on I sort of knew I wanted to work in TV or radio sport and um, you know very lucky to be able to do so. And the obvious question following on from that without meaning to make it sound like I'm asking you to pick between your two kids as such <laughs> to use a phrase is what do you prefer out of the production and that that buzz of being on air? Um, I'll probably be a little bit biased here in that the day job of TV production pays the bills so that's quite <laughs> important but no I mean I Listen, you can't you can't beat the buzz of live broadcasting, as as you know, Michael. I think um, when I've reported on things like the you know Rio Paralympics for Five Live and London 2012 for Five Live and the occasional football football match I do now, you know whether on final score or on the radio, you can't beat that that moment that they hand to you, and you know you've got 20 seconds, 40 seconds, two minutes, whatever it might be, that you are on air and. Um, you have to get it right, and, and then you're off again, and they're on to the next report. And there's just something very exciting about that. You get one one chance only, and uh, you know you can't you can't replace that. You can't beat that. But having said that, I've been very very lucky to have amazing experiences too in my TV production job, and and, you know, and that's that's something that I would never want to give up either. So it's tricky tricky to pick my favourite. The analogy of picking your favourite child is probably a good one. I'm not I'm not sure I can. And of course. It must be mentioned as well that you've got experience, quote-unquote, as a proper journalist because many will be familiar with the BBC price of football survey that every year causes people to mainly moan about how expensive the modern game has got. But back in 2013, you were the man primarily responsible for that. And I remember when I first met you, you explaining that actually for everything in broadcasting, that was one of your proudest achievements. Yeah, it was an interesting one, that. I mean, actually, I would say on the journalism front, the the... the qualification the postgrad qualification I did in card if that set me on the way to being you know a proper journalist as you say in, in quote marks and then the five years I had in BBC local radio at Radio Berkshire I, you know those were the years where I became a journalist and learned the skills learned the pitfalls learned the things to look out for learned how to do the job and those years were fantastic particularly at a relatively small station like Radio Berkshire you were thrown in at the deep end and on a lot of occasions and asked to do jobs you might not have been asked to do at, at bigger stations but it was actually off the back of that that I then did the price of football thing because uh, Charles Runcie who was head of sport for nations and regions at the BBC he was aware of me because of my time at Radio Berkshire and um, the price of football survey came at a really good time for me because I decided not to go to Salford with BBC I'd essentially given up my dream job in a lot of ways um, and I'd just gone freelance in the sort of January of 2013 and those first couple of months as a freelancer looking for work, sending your CV off left, right and centre were, you know, there were some demoralising moments and moments where I'm thinking, what the heck have I done? And it was actually Charles that picked up the phone completely out of the blue, I think it was sort of late February, early March, and said, listen, I know you haven't found anything yet in terms of a block of work, but I've got probably a few days' work for you to do, you can do it at home, 
uh, just utilize your contacts and, and put together this survey and so it was um, it was just great to be doing something again and actually over the course of the, the, the number of days I worked on that it was a really interesting gig to be on and, and then you know by the time it was published properly and put out on the website it was quite an important piece of work and you know they they still do that to this day in, in different ways so uh, you know I owe I owe Charles Runcie quite a bit for that first gig because it set me on my way. What's the best game you've ever commentated on and why? So yeah not to sound like the Charles Runcie fan club but this was another kind of opportunity that came my way kind of via him and um, an old friend and colleague of mine called Jim Cathcart who I'd worked with at BBC Berkshire and he'd uh, taken a, an idyllic job and lifestyle at BBC Radio Guernsey and he, Jim got in touch with me um, again completely out of the blue and said you know we need some commentators on the mainland of England to, to cover Guernsey Football uh, Club can you do a match for us so I went and did a match and it was you know I loved it straight away it was kind of real proper football proper tackles you know no egos no multi-million pound salaries it was just really genuine authentic football so I did that first match I was then asked to do a second match a few weeks later and then things snowballed a bit because Guernsey uh, got on a run in the FA Vars I ended up following them as the commentator all the way through to the semi-finals which I'll get onto in a second but the, the most remarkable match I've ever commentated on was now, Guernsey fans will correct me, but I think it was, let's say, third or fourth fourth round, and they were drawn away at a club called Erith Town in East London. Now, I'm pretty sure that Guernsey found themselves 3-0 down. One of their star players, who was a guy called, his surname was Zico Black. Believe it or not, he'd been named after Zico, the Brazilian legend. Zico Black broke his leg. It was, horrif- it was a horrific leg break. Uh, the match was halted for a good 30 minutes. An ambulance had to drive onto the pitch. It was one of those. It was, it was awful. So they were 3-0 down. Lost one of their star players to one of the worst injuries I've seen on a football pitch. And yet they somehow managed to battle back to get to 3-3 into extra time and Guernsey won it 4-3. And because of the massive injury delay, you know, you were talking it was like gone 6.30pm by the time the match finished. It was it was pretty remarkable but then in some ways even more amazingly they got to the semi-finals and it was a two-legged semi-final in the end sort of a sad end I'm afraid it doesn't have a happy ending this story in the end um, Guernsey were knocked out by Spennymore Town right and the second leg was at Spennymore and uh, we went all the way up to County Durham I think it was and um Guernsey were knocked out by a goal from a player who was playing for Spennymore Town who was called Andy Stevenson. No. And I had to commentate on a guy called Andy Stevenson scoring the goal that shattered my dreams of commentating on Guernsey at Wembley because you were literally a match from Wembley. And it was just the most, you know, you couldn't have written it really. People wouldn't have believed it had I written it down. And I remember I tweeted, I tweeted... Andy Stevenson of spending more time after the match and said, do you realise you know, what you did today? And we've sort of semi-kept in touch ever since. It was quite a, quite a funny story. But, you know, I'd done bits of reporting and commentating to a certain extent, but certainly reporting at Radio Berkshire. I'd reported on horse racing and myself and a guy called Ollie Williams, who people might know from... Um, he was BBC's Olympic reporter. Me and him commentated on ice hockey together at, at BBC Berkshire. So I'd done elements, but... You know, the Guernsey experience was uh, was really good, and I still look out for their scores now. And, you know, there's a guy, Ross Allen, I think, who scored, I think he scored his 200th goal for, Guern- excuse me, for Guernsey just the other weekend. And um, I just keep an eye out, because now I'm sort of really hoping that one or two of the Guernsey players sort of move up the leagues, and I'm able to I was there for when they, you know, beat Erith down 4-3 in the FA Vars. Absolutely brilliant story. Where do you see the industry in the future in terms of disability and allowing that to be part of broadcasting and embracing that diversity? Well, it's an interesting one for me, this, because there's a, there's a part of me that thinks that, you know, I've always, in a sense, I suppose, tried to keep my head down, if I can use that phrase, just and, and get on with doing the job. And actually, you know, I would, I would rather just be Andy who works for Whisper or you know reports for five live without the disability even coming into it but at the same time well I tell you I tell you why that's crucial because I think you know there has been a sense I've had when I was younger not so much now where I felt that the more I talked about the fact I was disabled 
and the more I talked about disability in the media, I was worried that I would then always just be known for that rather than being Andy to, the disabled guy yeah and you know it would it would deflect and distract from me being able to just get on and do do the job which is ultimately what I do however you know I don't know if it's an age thing or it's just you know the pennies dropped or there's too much out there that frustrates me on behalf of other people I've realized that actually I should speak about this subject and I should help others in my situation um, and I should take on some responsibility for trying to improve things. So that's been a, a change in me, I would say, being honest over the last few years. Um, what I would say about the, the diversity in the media and certainly the, the number or lack of people with disabilities in the media, I would actually say it's not all the media industry's fault. I see, I see a lot of work being done by the media industry to try and, um, you know, raise numbers and improve the experience of people with disabilities who either want to come into the industry or who already work in it. Um, Channel 4, you know, I worked at Channel 4 for a year. Channel 4 probably the the guiding light, you know, certainly top of the tree in that respect. Channel 4 make a heck of a lot of effort to improve the situation. My biggest point actually would be that I think it's things outside of the media industry that hold a lot of disabled people back. I'm very lucky in that I have a motability car. I have um, social service sort of funded helpers who, who help me personally when I'm at home. You know, essentially they help me get ready in the mornings and they help me come and do my job. These are all things that, that some disabled people aren't lucky enough to have. So therefore I feel as though the TV industry or the radio industry can do pretty much as, as much as they can possibly do to increase the number of disabled people working in this industry but without the kind of support of let's say you know central government local government there's a lot of these people out there who um, who just physically cannot do the job without that extra support away from the workplace um, you know I've heard stories about people who have you know have been overlooked for promotion or they haven't been able to get a particular job because they they haven't had the support worker necessary for them to you know go out filming or you know these kind of things now obviously the BBC Channel 4 ITV Sky whoever it might be should and, and could look into maybe plugging that that gap but ultimately if there's a disabled person out there who's desperate to be a football commentator but they don't have the let's say the social services support to get them up and ready to go and do that football match well what what realistically can the BBC be expected to do? The other specific point, which I see when I go round football grounds, is that again I'm quite lucky in that I, you know I have an artificial leg, but I can you know move around football grounds. Have you ever tried to go to a football ground in a wheelchair to get up to a media box, for example? Now, this you know this is a tricky issue in itself. In that you you know we we could sit here, I could sit here and say you know all football ground press boxes should be accessible by wheelchair but as that would be an astonishing amount of work necessary you know particularly the older grounds the lower divisions who pays for that and non-league as well yeah you know so it's it's certainly something that should be looked at and worked towards but you know what how how can you insist that every one of the 92 league clubs and the non-league ones as you say uh make their press box wheelchair accessible I mean I think it would be a laudable aim but I think practically uh, you're talking about a lot of time and effort and money um, you, could, you could potentially say that all Premier League clubs it should be part of the, the rules regarding the state of the press box in the Premier League, you could, could potentially do that because as we know the Premier League is awash with money um, whether you can do it further down the chain I'm not sure and of course we're not just talking about football here you know Centre Court press box at Wimbledon is is very old fashioned. Um, you know, actually, this new setup at Lords is probably very good. You know, but taking it sport by sport, it's. I shudder to think of how I would feel if I had the same ambitions that I had when I was a kid and as a teenager to be a sports reporter, and then found I wasn't even able to get where I needed to be physically in order to fulfil those ambitions. It would be devastating. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, I, I haven't got all the answers, but it's something that I think probably needs to be looked at, even if it only benefits a relatively small number of people.
Thank you very much for your time, Andy. Really appreciate it, both on your career and then on this issue, which clearly is something that needs more scope and more examination. Absolutely, yeah, no, thanks. Thanks very much for talking to me.